uh, to be uh, in Princeton and uh, the Department of Computer Science. Uh, is advised by uh, Margaret Martonosi and David Wenzler. Uh, and uh, well, uh, this I think he's about to defend. Uh, if he was here, I think he would have uh, defended long ago, but you know, they, they, are, they are taking it not so, not so as easy as we are taking it here. So, but he has done excellent work. Uh, he received uh, his, his homegrown, he received his BS uh, from uh, the University of uh, Murcia. And uh, his uh, expertise is in hardware innovations that are modular uh, to make SOC integration practical. Uh, so his research is on computer architecture from hardware RPL design and verification to software programming models of uh, novel architectures, uh, spanning a wide gamut, which is excellent. Uh, he worked uh, previously on ARM. He was contributing towards, uh, I think, the design of uh, three GPU uh, prototypes. Then he was at Cerebras, um, the wafer scale guys. Uh, and now he's with uh, AMD research uh, for some time. Uh, and uh, at the end, he's working towards designing the next generation data centers optimized for large uh, data structure diversity. So, uh, at Princeton, he contributed to academic chip payouts that aims to improve their performance, power, and programmability of several emerging workflows in the broad areas of machine learning and graph analytics. So, as you can see, we have a lot to uh, hear from him and a lot to discuss with him. So, without further ado, yeah. Go Thank ahead. you, Osman. So hello everyone and thanks for being here today where I will be presenting my PhD work on navigating heterogeneity and scalability in modern chip design. So a clicker. Let me get the mouse back. Okay. With the end of uh, the NART scaling and a slowdown of Moore's law, we are witnessing an unprecedented demand for more specialized and efficient chips. And this need spans from small scale implementations such as brain implants to uh, laptop chips to larger deployments within data centers. Driven by the unique performance needs and power constraint, these small scale devices are more prominently heterogeneous, making verification for both correctness and security a paramount concern. And is that the design and verification complexity grows with the number of unique hardware components. And in the meantime, large scale systems have another set of challenges. Since they have a many parallel computing units, the shift focus towards uh, matching compute with data demand and internode communication. And throughout today's presentation, we'll explore uh, these two challenges, which are major topics in the computer architecture research. About the challenge of memory intensive applications, Turing Award 2021, Jack Tongara and the precursor of supercomputing said that compute is easy, but memory is harder and harder. And this is why we have the trend of sparse and data intensive applications of bringing computing into the data instead of by vice versa. And all of the memory technology vendors are also exploring computing in memory or near memory to overcome these challenges. And these trends call for rethinking programming models and architectures for memory intensive applications. Regarding the design and verification challenge, while academia and industry are pushing towards an ecosystem of reusing hardware IP blocks, managing all of these pieces is becoming difficult. And these difficulties sometimes end in hardware bugs or security vulnerabilities. So overall, chip makers need to rethink the fundamentals of design approaches. We need modular automated methods to assist the design and verification of hardware IP blocks. And once we have introduced this, the rest of the talk, I will be covering these uh, main sections where the first two tackle this problem of scalable sparse data structure traversal. And the first uh, section will cover uh, our clean slate design where we move data, uh, sorry, compute the data actually, and then we are going to make a really large integration composing uh, chiplets and multi-chip nodes to process these very large graphs. And then in section two, I'm going to cover how uh, we create these intelligent data movers integrated with off-the-shelf cores to make this integration practical for actual chip tables. And in the last section, I'm going to cover our work on formal verification for heterogeneous chip designs where we're going to be very fine uh, model interaction to make sure that these RTL models don't 
uh, ever hang, collapsing the, the entire chip and leading to a reset, and also finding security vulnerabilities in all of these uh, heterogeneous components of modern SOCs. Without further ado, let's jump into enabling scalability for data intensive applications. Having studied the literature in parallel computing, by the 90s, we already had most of the parallelism styles that we have today, like SIMD or MIMD or Dataflow. So most of the modern parallel computing designs are about matching technology changes with the target application domains. Considering the amount of compute per data element and the regularity of accessing and communicating data, we can coarsely classify application domains into these three quadrants. Now, looking at modern parallel architectures with more than 1,000 PEs per node, they achieve good scaling results for applications within the dense computation domain. And why is such a scaling achieved? Because they have regular and often local communication patterns. Besides the fact that they have the count with large on-chip memories, their memory hierarchy and network choice provides insufficient support for sparse. And my work attempts to tackle that. In the next slide, I'm going to use the work I did during my internship at Cerebral System mapping multidimensional FFTs into the wafer scale engine to showcase how a system designed for dense compute domain can do okay in this low data reuse, but still regular domain that is FFT, but not for the regular domain where most of my research will focus on. The Cerebras wafer scale engine contains nearly a million processing elements where each one contains an in-order core, scratch on memory, and a router. And the goal was to perform a 3D FFT where n cube elements are parallelized across a matrix of PEs. And because this wafer scale engine has data flow routing, all of the communication is orchestrated explicitly, which makes the timing highly deterministic, and we can calculate the equations for the computation and the communication times. And we confirmed this experimentally, the communication time will dominate the runtime because of the 2D mesh network, whose bisection bandwidth only scales with the scale root of n. But interestingly, even with this handicap, this FFT achieved the fastest uh, runtime of these problem sizes, even faster than the uh, FFT implementation in the Summit supercomputer, which counts with a, a FAT3 network in the order of petabits per second bisection bandwidth. And the reason for that, is that the data flow routing enabled this high communication efficiency, but only because this communication is, even though it's all to all, still a regular communication pattern. And the data flow routing uh, comes with the extra effort of, of uh, more programming of these routers. So if we, after this work, I concluded that if we want to provide massive scaling for completely irregular unstructured sparsity, we need to rethink the network implications of this irregular fine-grained communication, including, of course, the software productivity. So here's the idea. What if we combine some of the concept of data flow computation of not having a memory hierarchy where each tile contains one piece of the main memory with an execution model where a program is split into a sequence of tasks that only operate on their local memory. Because of that, routing of this task could be done transparently based on the location of the data to be operated on. This could minimize data movement, potentially saving energy, and use the storage more efficiently because there are no copies of data. Every uh, All the data is statically partitioned. And since there are remote memory dependencies are broke into tasks, then this task would execute without the stall. And by default, every memory operation would be atomic because there is a single owner of each uh, data uh, region other space. But of course, you could bring a new set of challenges, like what does the program look like now? How do you parallelize a program in such an execution model? And most importantly, how do we spawn these fine-grained tasks without the invocation overheads beating the gains? because we would be effectively transforming the regular memory access pattern into regular communication of tasks across the chip. To overcome these challenges, my work Dalorex makes three contributions that will serve as an outline for what I'm going to cover in the next 10 minutes. First, I will talk about our parallelization strategy, where tasks are sent to processors based on the data that they have locally. So processors don't have an execution threat per se, but rather they are all the time reacting to incoming tasks. That's why I call this approach also like fine-grained data flow. Then we will talk about our execution model, 
where tasks uh, only access local data. So the program as a whole is a sequence of tasks invoking other tasks upon pointing direction. Then I will explain how our hardware, hardware task scheduler and network routing enable this decentralized distribution of fine-grained tasks. For this data local execution, the architecture will be very simple. Have all of the memory on chip sharded across the SRAM so that the data set is equally distributed across all the tiles. And since the tasks only use local data, the processing units will be very, very simple, but it's still software ISA programmable. And then the task flow is enabled by the network of routers and the scheduling units, which we will dig more detail later. For now, let's focus on how is the program parallelized. The bulk synchronous parallelization of graph traversal uses a frontier of vertices that uh, are explored using a parallel for loop. And then we have the frontier synchronization at the end of each epoch. Now, focusing on a single iteration of this parallel form, we find a series of pointing directions arising from the compressed parse format. And for this lasting direction, there is even an atomic uh, read modify update operation. And if the frontier is a list and is centralized, it would also need atomics. Um, since that rec requires these tasks only uh, operate on local data, we need to split the code at each point in direction so that the index array serves as a parameter to the next task. And let's dig in the next slide how this uh, split uh, program works. In task one, for this uh, vertex, we, this doesn't really work here. <laughs> for the vertex V, we load the pointers uh, to the edge list for in its neighbors. For example, in this case, uh, we would give values 32 to 34, and together with the current distance of the vertex to the root, these are parameters to the next task. The way we invoke this next task is by placing the invocation parameters into the output queue that goes into the network channel. And because the data is statically partitioned, the routing is going to be done based on the index to the edge array. And in this case, we would have 10 edges per tile so that the range of the 30s index is going to fall into tile three. And once it arrived into the destination, then task two would be ready for execution. Task two will loop over the pointers and spawn in this case, two new tasks. One for neighbor 15, which is located here in this case in tile 15, just for the illustration purposes. And one for neighbor number five, which is going to be located on neighbor number five. So the processing of the next task is going to be done at the tile that owns that piece of data. And keep in mind that while these tasks are invoked in a sequence, there are many, many sequences happening in parallel for every vertex in the frontier. And so it's going to be a very throughput oriented design. And now regarding task three, let's see more detail in the hardware how task three will be invoked. The channel at which the task parameters arrive will determine the task type. And there are uh, input and output queues for each type. The task scheduler uh, unit or TSU will take the message, which is composed of the task invocation parameter and place it into the input queue. And based on the tasks that are already waiting at the head of the input queue, the TSU will decide which one to ex schedule next based on a policy that we will see in a minute. And the task will execute without stall because it only operates on local data. Uh, which also makes make operation intrinsically atomic. And you might have realized by now that the parallelism level is really determined by the number of uh, tiles that have tasks ready to be executed. So if we want to route and schedule task to optimize the overall performance, we need to maximize this global objective where the TSU can only use the information it has uh, locally, which is the network traffic and the occupancy of the input and output queues. We're going to prioritize the task whose output queue is nearly empty to spawn more work for others and prioritize task whose input queue is nearly full to prevent endpoint contention uh, that would back pressure the network. And regarding the network itself, because the data set is statically partitioned and the hardware TSU, the task scheduler, knows the distribution, the routing inside the network doesn't need an extra header to determine the destination because it's already encoded in the payload. 
And this is also a bit how the cerebral system is doing this uh, scheduling based on um, this data flow. And finally, we are going to evaluate both a 2D mesh and a 2D torus because we found um, that with the torus you have more uh, with the mesh you have more contention towards the center, whereas the torus will uh, smooth out uh, uniform in, uniform communication uh, that will reduce the hotspots. Our path to how high utilization was done with a series of optimizations. Having all of the data set distributed on chip doesn't get you performance per se. The execution model relies on the pipeline effect, and there are a series of challenges that can thwart a high throughput. When we started from the basic X architecture with round robin scheduling of tasks, the average, average utilization was below 10%. And the heat map here will show uh, 16 by 16 uh, tiles, where the darker the color, the higher the percentage of the runtime that the processing unit was executing tasks. And the next step, we added our traffic aware scheduling based on what I mentioned before of the occupancy of the input and output queues to increase overall performance. And then we observed, as I mentioned, this uh, contention towards the center of the 2D mesh. Here, I only show the PU utilization, but I have another heat map where you show the router utilization and clearly shows uh, the contention towards the center. So we changed that with a 2D folded torus that will create a better routing, reducing contention, and therefore increasing to, uh, you are able to feed all of the cores better. And if you remember from the previous code on the frontier synchronization, this is the bulk synchronous parallelization of graph traversal. But because um, we have all of the data distributed across the tiles, the frontier itself is also decentralized. And once we had this decentralized frontier, it was fairly easy to remove the frontier synchronization and just let the tiles explore their own local frontier when they don't have any more work to do. So removing this synchronization point, it also led to increased utilization. So all in all, this combination of improvement was able to get the PUs to be executing tasks more than 90% of the time. And I also want to clarify that when the PU is not uh, executing tasks, it's completely powered down because the scheduler will give it a next task to execute. So if there is no next task, then it will clock it down the, the PU. And for all of our, our evaluations, we don't do any data set pre-processing or graph partitioning. So this could, for larger graph, it could lead to higher uh, utilization. And I cannot get into details for the sake of time, but the optimizations we made in uh, Dalorex achieved two orders of magnitude gains over prior work Tesseract, the previous uh, near memory compute uh, design uh, with an equal number of cores. In terms of limitations, however, we evaluated the scaling up to, in this paper uh, that was presented at HPCA, up to 16,000 tiles, where the network contention and work imbalance eventually led to a performance plateau, and in part because of the bisection bandwidth. And then the uh, utilization was uh, much reduced, like we will see in the heat map there. However, um, also Dalarex proposes a costly solution since it proposed all the main memory be on SRAM, setting also a threshold on the minimum number of tiles that you need to run a certain data set. It kind of forces you to scale out the bigger your data set, you have to go to a bigger chip. So to overcome those limitations, uh, we propose our next approach, which is called Taskade, where we use uh, to solve the uh, contention for very distant communication, we use a local aggregation of uh, tasks at proxy tiles that will um, before doing a long distance communication will aggregate work and kind of like in a re reduction manner converts towards the data owner. And an integration of compute and memory chiplets to decouple the memory capacity per tile from the silicon tape out process. And for the sake of time, I will skip over this proxy tile section and I will uh, dig more into the chiplet integration, which helps optimizing different target metrics at packaging time. The design of this Taskade chiplet is agnostic of how many chiplets will be placed on the final package. There are both package time and software time configurations. For example, the configuration uh, of the network on chip topology enables a subgrid of tiles within uh, this large fabric to be also a torus within itself, within a chiplet or across chiplets or across chip packages. So we can have this uh, configurable 2D topology. 
And now looking at it from the section view, the chiplet integration allows us to uh, choose the memory capacity at um, chip packaging time. So once you have tip out these uh, chiplets, uh, the same design will be able to interleave these uh, high bandwidth memory chiplets with a silicon interposer on top of a organic package substrate without changing the design of the task chiplet. So the idea is that because the mask set of a new um, wafer uh, will cost all, over $10 million for uh, reduced uh, transistor sizes, we want to tape out the same uh, chiplet without having to decide at silicon time how, whether you want to add high bandwidth memory or not in your final chip package. And here I'm going to present on the y-axis the improvement on throughput per dollar and energy efficiency per dollar of these two uh, task gate options with uh, HBM or not, normalized with the performance we were getting with Dalorex. And the uh, Dalorex and SRAM only task gate will use a larger configuration, in this case 64 by 64 and 128 by 128 for ARMA 26. Since that's the uh, smallest configuration that fits the entire data set because everything is SRAM, while the HBM configuration uses a, a smaller 16 by 16 configuration for ARMA 25 and 32 by 32 for ARMA 26, because again, that's the smallest configuration where you fit the data set. So we're going to be comparing how do they do in performance per dollar and efficiency, given that you are forced to scale out or not with HBM or not. First, the first thing we observe is that uh, there's a 2.5 geomini speedup in performance from um, this task gate to Dalorex, which is just coming from the fact that we had these proxy regions, which I didn't go into detail, but when you scale out, if, if we proxy the, the task instead of always sending to the owner, we were able to get this, this uh, performance. And then the task gate SRAM wins across the board on throughput per dollar, because it scale out 16 times more, but it doesn't cost to manufacturers 16 times more because the HBM devices are actually pretty expensive. So the takeaway here is that if you want to be the fastest or fastest per cost, you, it was a good idea not to use HBM. However, um, if we wanted to optimize for energy efficiency, we found that the HBM version is much more energy efficient because in the end, there's a lot of uh, energy going into the network. If we are forced to scale out, we need to send data farther away and data move, uh, movement of data bytes throughout the system end up being the energy main, main source of energy consumption. So it was interesting. We found that two different um, integrations with or without HPM led to pretty different metrics with respect to performance or energy efficiency. So it supported the idea of having this chiplet design be the same with or without uh, deciding yet what's going to be the target metric that we want to optimize. And getting into absolute uh, scaling result, uh, the x-axis here is going to be the size of the tile grid that is used ranging from 256 to over a million tiles. And we're going to measure this uh, throughput. And on the top, we show the uh, traverse edge per second, which is how they measure graph traversal because it doesn't make sense to measure flops because there are no floating point operations. And the average on-chip uh, memory bandwidth that was required to achieve that. Whereas in the bottom, I show the throughput per watt and throughput per dollar. And both axes are logarithm and higher is better. From the top, we said that uh, the increase in performance is possible because of the memory bandwidth scale with the number of tiles. We add more HBM devices and more SRAM, so it doesn't get saturated. And the net result is that our 1 million tile parallelization over 256 uh, nodes achieved over 3,000 gigateps for BFS on ARMA 26, which is 3.4 times faster than the best result from the Graph 500 on this uh, problem size. And although I don't show here ARMAT 22, which is a smaller data set, by the way, ARMAT 22 means that there are two to the power of 22 um, vertices and four times more uh, edges. And the same with, these are synthetic graphs that are used to benchmark this uh, graph 500 because it's easier to scale, you just have the number 
to do the number you have there of vertices. And in the figure of the bottom, we observe that if the gobs per watt is the key metric, then staying with the smallest configuration, making use of HPM, it's better, but uh, which is not the case for giga ops per dollar. To summarize, Dalorex plus Taskade proposed this hardware software co-design demonstrated scaling up to 1 million uh, cores using an execution model where the tasks only access local data. So the program as a whole is a sequence of tasks invoking other tasks upon the pointing direction. And a hardware task scheduler with a lightweight network routing that enabled this decentralized distribution of fine-grained tasks. We performed this local aggregation of tasks at proxy tiles prior, prior to long distance communication and an integration of compute and memory chiplets that allows to optimize different target metrics at packaging time post silicon. Regarding takeaways, we learned that transforming an irregular data access problem into regular communication of this fine-grained task introduces a local clogging uh, at BC tiles on the network. This creates hotspots and an overall reduction of performance. So we solved that with uh, load balancing network design and task buffering and smart um, task or orchestration. And observe our large, uh, largest parallelization steps the probability of hotspot increases due to the uh, working balance because of very hot vertices on like this very inequality on the dataset graph. However, we expanded a lot how far this graph processing can be parallelized. And finally, we, sh uh, we I believe that we shouldn't need a dedicated system to process sparse workload since the memory per, per tile uh, and the network can be configured post silicon. So the same architecture could potentially be used for AI more dense compute oriented many cores. In terms of uh, research impact, we just open source three days ago, uh, our simulator for both the uh, Dalorex and Taskade uh, works. It's a simulator for multi-chip, multi-chiplet um, data centric execution that uh, enables this uh, PGAS like partition global address space uh, Simulation. So we open source it because we have heard from other researchers they wanted to use it. So, uh, would, yeah, if someone is interested, let me know. And then, uh, finally, um, just to mention that this work also achieved the gold medal in the SRC SIG Micro competition. Um, the task, yeah, Dalorex was presented at HPCA and uh, Task KD is in submission. And now we have passed the deep dive chapter. The remaining two will be covered more briefly for purpose of this presentation. So getting into the next chapter of building practical latency tolerance for off-the-shelf processors. Although this work targets the same application domain of sparse uh, data structure traversal, um, the contribution still applies because um, the work I presented now, it was a completely clean slate design, whereas this is uh, integrated with off-the-shelf processors. This was part of the Decades project, which is a DARPA funded software defined hardware program, which is strive for a runtime reconfigurable hardware to accelerate data intensive applications in the domains of machine learning and graph analytics. And these applications use a mix of sparse and dense workloads. So we had to account for that. And as we saw in the previous chapter, traversing a sparse structure requires pointing direction. And so the Decades uh, chip needed to a way to tolerate this uh, latency of irregular memory accesses, but also have enough compute power. This decade chip had this many core design with several processing uh, units, including fixed function accelerators and in-order cores, but this in-order cores don't support uh, memory intensive uh, workloads. So in order to add more memory level parallelism, we needed a mechanism to tolerate long latency of, of irregular memory accesses or IMAs effectively adding more uh, MLP to the system without, but we required to do that without adding much uh, verification burden because we had to tape out the chip with a small academic team in over a year. So first thing, when we look at the literature, there's been a lot of work on the field of prefetching, decoupling uh, data access and compute and software pipelining. And this list is by no means comprehensive, but there are some of the most recently works on, on this field. However, we found that they had one thing in common. 
they are either software only techniques that rely on the processors to have some inherent uh, MLP, or they require some more intrusive hardware changes or additional ISI instruction. So since in the decades chip, we were using third party cores from uh, open source ETH Zurich, we wanted to uh, leave them as they are, not modify them to avoid the extra verification burden. So we designed this out of the core hardware block, which is connected to the network on chip and targeted via API operations that don't require new instructions. We figured out how to mitigate these IMAs without modifying the cores or the cache hierarchy. And in order to enable adoption of latency tolerant techniques into many core SOCs, we proposed Maple, which is a memory access parallel load engine that implements decoupling and prefetching in a piece of hardware that is outside the core connected to the network on chip. Maple API can be targeted from off the shelf cores using solely existing memory instructions and thus the mechanism is agnostic to the core ISA. And since these operations are producing data, but mostly pointers for Maple to fetch and place into the queues, uh, these pointers really are virtual addresses. So Maple supports virtual memory thanks to its fully capable uh, memory management unit. And I'm not going to get into implementation details because I want to get into uh, how uh, different software techniques provide MLP uh, to the Decades chip using this technique. Throughout the API, Maple can fetch uh, asynchronous loads uh, decoupled with the Decades compiler, but also asynchronous read modified, like asynchronous atomic operations introduced by graph attack, and in addition to individual just pointers. Moreover, um, Maple includes in a, a piece of hardware to fetch entire loops of these indirect memory accesses. In this code example, I mark the indirect memory access, as you see in the pointer in direction in red. We're going to add this Lima loop of indirect memory access uh, prefetch operation outside the loop to fetch in hardware all of the uh, fetches inside the inner loop that we had before, and then swap the IMA for a just consume from the queue. In order to use Maple, first we have to allocate a particular instance because like it happens in the decade chip, there are many Maple units, particularly 23 of them inside what they call the intelligence storage tile. And we have mentioned that these Maple operations are under the hood loads and stores. So the cores interact with Maple uh, by mapping its corresponding physical page into virtual memory so that a process can, can use it with uh, exclusive protected access to the net, uh, Maple hardware resources. And this API handles the mapping process of Maple units internally, providing a abstract concept of uh, software queues to the programmer or the compiler pass or DSL domain specific language developer. Now getting into result, uh, our, although our ISCA paper presented work on FPGA with two Arian cores and a Maple unit, uh, since we couldn't fit more stuff into the FPGA, once we had the chip back, which is the one I have there in the corner, um, this helped evaluate further scalability. So first we observed that the first the, the, the two core uh, experiment match our prior FPGA evaluation that we had in the paper. And then we now with the chip back, we observed that prefetching up to 16 cores uh, achieved 7.4 uh, speed up compared to the two, or two, two core um, version, which is pretty good. And then at the same time, the dual uh, implementation, it's reaching a plateau. So to summarize, Maple enable both prefetching and decoupling, where its specialized hardware doesn't need architecture or core changes. And unlike many prior work, it's easy to integrate in such a way that it can be used inside SOC generator frameworks like uh, OpenPDON or uh, ESP as a plug and play latency tolerance mechanism. Our full stack SOC prototype on top of Linux we did on FPA showed the speed ups around 2x for prefetching that we were validating later with the chip evaluation. 
And the takeaway is that this Maple hardware software co-design benefits from combining program knowledge with hardware specialization to achieve a good performance at a low area overhead. And again, in terms of impact, Maple hardware and software uh, has been open source. We made uh, videos for FPA tutorials and also the paper got the 2023 uh, top picks honorable mention, and it's already inspiring latent work. Uh, two of them, uh, well, they were integrated uh, into papers that were published at Astros this year, uh, both as a fetch engine into the cohort accelerator framework and as a use case for the multi chiplet cloud FPA simulator. And um, let's see how the last section explained the work I did on leveraging formal verification to assist the RTL design on heterogeneous architectures. While the previous section was about introducing yet a new hardware component to fetch memory, there are many, many more hardware components being proposed and open sourced in the last decade to accelerate many other functions. So in this Cambrian explosion of hardware components that led to heterogeneous chip designs, where RTL uh, models uh, might have been developed in different contexts, now interact with each other. And again, the Degas chip was an example of this, where people in charge of different models need to be ensured that they uh, behave as expected, because the software process can hang if a hardware model in the chain of transaction within the chip doesn't ever respond. Or if a process may leave um, secret trace into the hardware state that can be recovered by a spy. So my work focuses on these uh, problems of uh, liveness and microarchitecture cover channels because I saw this opportunity uh, leveraging my prior industry experience at ARM with formal verification of RTL to automatize certain aspects of this design cycle thanks to formal verif property verification tools. Particularly, verifying the transactions between RTL models that to check that they are well formed and they make forward progress in the chain of transactions and to ensure that components with hardware state are properly flushed between uses from different software processes. And when we're going to briefly cover my work on these two aspects, starting from verifying liveness on hardware model interactions. This is not the first time that one applies formal verification to this problem. In fact, I learned about the above methodology uh, while I was working in the industry. And what I found is that creating a formal verification uh, test bench for this particular problem can be automated, as I showed below. And this, this is because the most of the model interactions in RTL follow a similar valid ready handshake pattern. And instead of having a verification engineer who is interacting with the hardware designer as it works in the industry, uh, I believe we can. Uh, this can be done solely by the hardware designer, especially if we are doing academic chip debouts, we don't have the budget to have a dedicated verification engineer. And AutoSV will automatically generate these system verlog assertions and also configure the specific formal verification tool that you are using as a, as a backend without needing to go through the steep uh, learning curve. And as I show in blue, the, the hardware designer would only need to specify what the interface's signal could look like and use this AutoSVA annotation language and then debug the counterexamples that you get from the tool. But how does AutoSVA do this in practice? Let me show you. I'm going to walk through the steps of this process, but Please don't try to reach much of the code that is on the slide. It's there to illustrate the steps. So as a, as a hardware designer, I'm developing this load store unit inside the CVA6 Ariane core. And I want to check that the load interface doesn't have a corner case where it will get stuck. We're going to annotate what the external interface signals trigger a load request using these common transaction attributes like valid, ready, or transaction ID. And I won't go much into details, but they're they are in the paper. And based on these annotations, AutoSVA will generate SVA properties that would otherwise be written by a verification engineer. This will be generated by the tool. And also the tool specific commands that are needed to, to link to the specific tool. And like a Jasper Goal or other uh, like Symbiosis, uh, Josis. 
And finally, on this load interface of Ariane, a uh, counterexample we found in the paper resulted being a bug. And thanks to having this formal methodology in plan, we could also more confidently test the bug fixes that we were going to apply than if we were doing just RTL simulation. It would be more hard to make sure that the timing is not tricking us. And as a fun fact, from the process of discussing this bug fix with the maintainers of CVA6 Ariane, we started a brainstorm of, of how to leverage former vacation to find microarchitectural cover channels, which was his line of research also. Where in that case, we're going to answer to this question of, is there any hardware state, mm -hmm. flip-flops or memory cells that may encode a secret or part of it from the victim process that may be observed in any way by a spy process? when it gets to eventually use the same hardware component. So we are going to be tackling here time multiplex uh, executions on the same pieces of hardware. And this could apply to all of the state within these hardware components, CPUs or accelerators that uh, this software process is interacting with. We found that we could answer that question in an exhaustive manner, again, using formal property verification by setting up a design under test or DUT wrapper with two instances of the same RTL model that we will call universes alpha and beta. And given that the DUT has two sets of inputs now and two sets of outputs from each of the universe, we let the input to take any given value given the formal engine until the end of the victim process, which we mark here with number two. Without getting much into details, we set as a precondition for the context switch event to happen that the architecture state is equal by the end of the victim process in both universes. This could be the effect of the operating system doing its job properly, uh, context uh, swapping the register file. And um, in the step three, we only ask the tool whether there is any differences could be observable or visible to the architecture state arising from the fact that the microarchitecture state might be different that was left and flashed after the context switch. In this figure from the AutoCC paper, we give a description of each context sample that we either uncover a bug or a potential uh, cover channel together with the sequential depth of the formal verification tool as a standalone model. And we found that two hardware bugs in CVA6, also known as Ariane, and potential cover channels uh, there, and also in vScale and a an hardware accelerator for AES encryption. These are open source projects. And I, I say potential because we hadn't tried to reproduce the cover channels at system level, which we did do for the cover channels that we found actually in Maple. Uh, we, and we reproduce the, the possible attack in an RTL uh, simulation environment that we use for the decades chip. So Peter, we didn't find it later before taping out the chip. Um, this uh, cover channel required a Trojan to actively leak the, the secret key at the maximum rate of 16 uh, bits at a time. And the actual hardware bugs that we found in CVA6 are now merged into the repo maintained by the open hardware group because this was an interesting find that we were looking for cover channel, but in the meantime, the contact samples given by the tool also cover some like functionality bug. And to summarize this um, chip design and verification complexity grows with the number of unique hard, hardware components and formal property verification is the right tool to use since it can exhaustively search for bugs via assertions at an early stage of the project. But, this SVA and formal tools are hard to use and reason about. So Auto SVA offers this framework to automatically generate formal verification test benches for RTL models to ensure that they follow the interface expectations based on the designer annotations. This pays off quickly as it saves time in debugging during the simulation and increases the designer confidence that the model will not hang once you integrate it into the larger system. And from the security side, AutoCC leverages a similar test event generation flow from AutoSVA to create a methodology to automatically find cover channel, potential cover channels. Interestingly, we found that in this process, it may also uncover these hardware bugs. So it's not only useful for security, but also design and verification. 
And finally, um, although I haven't said it before, AutoCC also offered two methods for constructing how the designer construct the flash mechanism between the context switcher, either incrementally upon finding potential cover channels or decrementally starting from a very strict uh, flash and then finding a minimal set of uh, state flash. In terms of impact, AutoSBA has been open sourced and we created a tutorial uh, that was presented at DAC with some success because 33 people started the repo and it was uh, forked by people from 10 companies. And I also tried to present this work at a broader audience uh, presenting at the open source uh, computer architecture research workshop collocated with ISCA last year. And more recently, AutoSBA was featured in the community blog from Josis SQ, which is an EDA provider from uh, Austria. And getting to AutoCC, the bugs we we found were merged into the upstream repo, and maintained by the open hardware group, where the 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 issue seemed so clear that they were wondering how did they uncover this problem before. And this showcases the importance of formal verification because it wasn't found with their uh, simulation based uh, test benches, which are really mature because this project is been going on for uh, nearly a decade now. And then we had also another commit with fixing up potential uh, timing channel. Now getting towards the end of the presentation, I wanted to wrap up with how my research journey navigating heterogeneity and scalability in modern chip design has contributed to the field. At the beginning of my PhD, I landed in this project uh, joined with Princeton and Columbia uh, decades uh, that they had a simulation compiler environment uh, already in place, but we had to transform the simulation architecture ideas into a, a chip design. To that end, I created this RTL of Maple, which for the first time in the literature, uh, this specialized uh, specialization in the hardware didn't come at the cost of modifying or tailoring CPUs or memory architecture. And eventually Ma Maple made it to the decades chip. Um, during the process of designing Maple, where, which needed to handle a lot of complex memory interaction, including receiving transaction from the core, translating to virtual memory, and, and other complex interaction action arising from SOC designs, this motivated my work on verifying liveness and control safety properties of RTL models using formal methods, which then was used uh, to also find hardware state that can lead to cover channels when left and flash between the process using RTL model. Going back to 2021, I had the opportunity to program and evaluate the Cerebras wafer scale engine for several communication and memory intensive applications, including histogram and FFT. And the FFT one was presented at ICS last week. And in this paper, we found that message overheads are very important when taking strong scaling to the extreme, paralyzing as much as we can. And moreover, in that uh, case, I learned the hard way that modern data flow architectures are really not thought for irregular communication. It was both hard to program and the network which does not fit for it. And this work inspired exploring sparse application beyond the decade chip on a very large integration of course with all of the memory on chip, systematically solving the challenges for efficient task routing and scheduling, including the task gate work to make data lo local execution more practical with a chiplet uh, based design. And rounded here are the three main sections that I presented today. And based on these uh, sections, there are going to three blocks of, of contribution starting from having moved the needle in scaling the sparse data structure traversal to the level of processing two to the 26 vertices, as we saw in uh, ARMA 26, across two to the 20 processing units without resorting to dataset partitioning. And is that until now, fine-grained and irregular memory accesses prematurely plateaued scaling of sparse workloads unless the dataset was pre-processed or partitioned. And combining ideas of mitigation of uh, com bringing compute to the data with new technologies, my work proposed this scalable multi-node system outperforming previous best results from the Graph 500 list including a chiplet-based architecture that allows post-silicon chip customization for cost, energy efficiency, and performance, which has the potential to con configure a chip package for a compute-to-memory ratio suitable for different applications domain. 
With regard of the next uh, contribution, I built this uh, memory access engine that allows off-the-shelf cores without memory level parallelism to hide the latency of irregular access patterns. And is that software techniques for latency tolerance are not effective on a small in-order course and implementing prior hardware approaches render impractical. While Maple allows for hardware specialization to software techniques with a practical integration. My work also pioneered this software hardware communication mechanism between CPUs and not connected component that has influenced later work on accelerator integration and communication. And finally, my work contributes to assisting RTL uh, design of heterogeneous SOCs for liveness and security via modular uh, formal verification. And is that the more hardware components that the software process will touch, the higher the risk that the model in the chain of events could either hang or cause a security vulnerability. So my work proposed this formal verification methodologies to test liveness and data leakage in RTL blocks, enabling a more robust and secure design process, including a tool for automat automated generation of these formal verification environments to make it more accessible to hardware designers. Well, I wanted to acknowledge my uh, great collaborators uh, from Princeton and other institutions and my advisors, Margaret Martonosi and David Venslav. And to finish, I will just leave this slide on the screen so you get a full picture of this navigating heterogeneity and scalability in modern chip design. That concludes the talk. And thank you for being here today. I hope I made good use of your time. And now I will be ready to take questions. OK. Uh... Maybe we can start with the questions uh, from the audience face to face and then take questions, if any, from the online folks. Uh, there was a lot to cover. Uh, he was asking me what should I present. And I said, why don't you present all? Because for two reasons, there are different people that are familiar with different aspects of your work and then they could benefit in, from the different parts. And as a bonus, he's staying uh, this week here. So tomorrow, for example, he's also here. So you could you could go in depth, you know, uh, more if you, if you would like to. But let's let's take questions for now. Questions? Yes, for, Julia. For task partitioning, like you say, like you want to keep like data locally in every processing unit. That's what I understand on the in the, the logic side. Yeah. How would you like? How do you select which data belongs to a task? Like, do you select like long latency memory accesses to partition the task, or what would be like the metric to say this data belongs to this task, this data belongs to this task, and I just have the channel to solve that? Okay. Yeah. So I think the question is how are the tasks split? So the because each task we force it to you can only operate on a given uh, data like other space range. If the task is going to touch outside that, you need to spawn a new task because at the limit, the, the constraint we put on the execution model is that the task will only operate on a specific address range. And the address range is based on uh, the, the amount of tiles we have. So if you have only SRAM, the address range is going to be the size of your local SRAM. If we have HPM, it could be a larger other space. So whenever and access will go outside this other space, you are forced. And because many times you just don't know whether it's going to go, every time you have a point in the direction, we, sp we split into two tasks. Okay, and you like statically divide the data set depending on the size of the storage that you have, right? That's yeah, we, okay. yeah you, you, you shard this data set in advance. It's a compile time configuration. And then for the messages, message passing between the tasks, do you have like a hardware message passing controller or it's going to like a, a memory mapping? So it's, so the memory mapping would be if we had this partition global address space, here is more done on the hardware. Like it's kind of co-designed the execution model with the hardware because uh, you would spawn a new task if you know that you're going to do a remote operation. And because, um, this is a compile time configuration. At the router, we have a, some microcode to say, okay, if you're going to access this index, the router will know because of the sharding who is going to be the owner. So when you put it into the output queue, you just put it into the output queue. You don't know what's happening. You say, okay, I'm going to spawn a task for someone. And then the router will, based on that someone, 
get it to the right place without that explicit, explicit header. And then for the communication between triplets is something like... It's the same. Okay. Yeah, it would be the same logical view. It could span all, the, yeah. But under the hood, you would need to go through the phi die to die between the triplets. And for the second topic that you mentioned, Mapo, there are two words in micro in 2020, I think, and HPC 2021. One name is Hats and the other is that graph that they do like a similar structure fetcher connected to like connected to queues to the core to the to the memory, and then like they fetch through queues to the to the core of the data that they are fetching. Like it, it will be related, or do you? Like, so I I have heard so Hats. I think at the moment we cited and the dev graph I've seen on the graph 500 list. I think. Yeah. Um, they are related. There's a lot of prior work in this field. So what Maple contribution was that we could do that without modifying the memory uh, hierarchy or the course. So I'm not sure whether this work probably do some hardware modifications of this to support this Q system. Well, in the case, what they do is that they put the hardware between L2 and L1. Uh, yeah. We are not connected to the NOC. That's, that's true. In your case, that it would be more like another processing unit connected yeah. to the NOC. So yeah, that includes the... Uh, memory hierarchy modifications. So uh, yeah, I've seen this work being tackled from every perspective. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, yes. So about Darolex, I wonder, um, so in the version that only uses s mm -hmm. you are partitioning your data all over the s but I wouldn't say partition, I would say sharding, sharding. because the partitioning word is usually used to mm -hmm pre-process the data set in advance. Here, we're just taking the, the data set and literally just sharding it into okay. the tiles, yeah. What happens if you if your disk is too large? Yeah, so large. I was mentioning before that in, in the SRAM only version, you are forced to scale out. It's not a choice, oh, I want to parallelize more. No, you have to because you have to fit your data set without the S, within the SRAM. So what Taskade was, was trying to solve is like, okay, this is, too expensive. Uh, although I have to say, HBM devices are also pretty expensive. So in the end, it was not the <laughs> a clear cut. But at least you can scale less in that sense. You are not as forced to scale, mm -hmm. and um, therefore we ended up also saving energy because scaling out is good for performance. But in terms of energy operations per like joules per operation, then it's not as good. I guess it's good because it's like, like the, the choice of HBM. It's not so different from an off chip zero. The only mm -hmm. difference is that you, you get very, very high bandwidth. Yeah. I, I we could have DRAM, we could have um, work DDR. We could have DDR. The difference is the bandwidth. But what, what, what the interesting thing of Taskade is that for the first time, we could over uh, interleave this um, compute dice with uh, memory dice. So in every like cluster chip that you've seen from Intel or AMD, they have their computing elements in the chiplets or chip monolithic chip in the middle, and then surrounded by an army of HBM devices. What we try to do in this approach is if we want to make packages potentially very big, can we just interleave? And we had to solve some challenges from the physical implementation to, to figure out whether you could route the, the links below the chiplets. But it turns out like, it's a possible approach to interleave and potentially make a package larger. Yeah. That, that's why also in it wouldn't be so practical, right? It's a matter of, of memory bandwidth. If you're going to, like, actually one thing that I was interested in too, the, the problem is that the HBM memory uh, controller, it's on the compute die. So, if we could like somehow like FPGA this memory controller on the compute size, we could have different protocols for DDR or HPM. So what I would be very interested into is like whether you can take that decision of integrating DDR or HPM post silicon again and reconfigure your memory controller from the other silicon side. In that sense, you can, if you say, okay, I want to make the design less fast, but really cheap or more memory capacity, that, that that would be another design decision. And I like this post silicon decisions of for different target metrics. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I have a question for the memories. Uh, 
you mentioned that on the computing this sparse graph application, you have hot, hot spots in mm -hmm. the uh, database. Yeah. And mm -hmm. as you mentioned, this picture was uh, built up from the small processing data nets mm -hmm. with a uh, low power library. Mm -hmm. And have you considered to have a kind of heterogeneous processing uh, data nets like some big, some small, and try to uh, select between the different if, if the node is a hotspot or not? And who will add on in the file? So what I'm hearing is if we know in advance which tiles are going to be hot or not, if we can map them to more beefy computing elements than other, the problem is that you don't really know in advance unless you inspect the data set, uh, which it's it falls into what I would call data set pre-processing. If you have to go through the data set, and also these applications, tra graph traversal, they, in the end, you go through the data set once. So if you pre-process the data set to be able to process it, you're doing almost double the work, which, I mean, if you can find a lot of papers in pretty nice conferences, which they do that and they call it a day, but uh, I don't know, I don't think it's fair to process, like go through the data set just to figure out your optimal mapping into your hardware substrate. So, yeah. Uh, more than a kind of a runtime. Yeah. Uh, if you could, you would need to migrate. So another thing I'm interested in is in some uh, task kit stealing or work delegation. So we have this mapping in the beginning. And then if you realize you have too many tasks, if, if you could do some task delegation to other tiles, which contain late data, which are less hot, but then that kind of, you need to do some hardware changes because it defeats the the rule of every tile can only operate on its local data. So then you the operations are not anymore atomic by default. So you could we do that kind of with these proxy tiles that uh, I mentioned, but only for read only data or for data that you can do like reduction operations or like associative operations. But yeah, it work, yeah, it, it's an interesting approach. Thank you. Uh, yeah, if it's quick, yes. No, I'm like following what you said. Like, for example, if you have iterative graph algorithms traversing once just to get the input of all the code nodes, it's not that expensive. And that's what all the prior work says. They said, yeah, yeah if you if you do that enough times, it's not too expensive, and we could do that too. But uh, it's it's a fair question. Yeah. Okay, we have. Uh... If, if you have questions uh, for the <clears throat> online uh, folks on Zoom, uh, please type. Uh, there's one question. Scaling up to 1 million cores can be very useful for processing AI, specifically graph neural network mm -hmm. based Indeed. applications. Yeah. Or graph neural networks. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you considered uh, benchmarking such applications? Yeah, so I've looked at the graph neural networks and they do uh, some bounded like K-hop exploration like in BFS. So I haven't benchmarked it yet, but there is uh, looked into it and it could be it could be a very killer app in that sense. And it's very popular. Like there's a lot of, there are actually some like survey work from Sergi Avadal, I think on, on graph neural networks, which shows like a, a lot of accelerators. And, and I think this data local execution would be also a good fit for graph like GNNs. Yeah. Good question. Okay, I think, is there any other questions from the online folks? No? Okay, let's thank him again. Thank you very much. He's here tomorrow too, uh, right? Uh, yeah. Well, so if you would like to talk, uh, just let me know if there is second floor. I was a bunch of people.